give you a few moments to find the text of the scripture reading today. Turn to Psalm 34, verse 8. And then after you find uh, Psalm 34, verse 8, it'll be real e easy to just turn the page over to Psalm 36, and there we will read verses 5 to 9. Psalm 34, 8. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusts in him. Psalm 36, 5 to 9. Your mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens, and your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the great mountains. Your judgments are a great deep, O Lord. You preserve man and beast. How excellent is your loving kindness, O God. Therefore, the children of men put their trust under the shadow of your wings. They shall be abundantly satisfied with the richness of your house, and you shall make them drink of the river of your pleasures. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light shall we see light. Good morning. So good to sing together. And uh, half of uh, what I enjoy on these Sunday mornings when we're together is just realizing we are all focused on the same one who means so much to each of us. We have that common life and that common love. And we can sing praises that are in common uh, from all of our hearts to the Lord, and what a blessing. And so just thank you for coming this morning to add your voice and to add your heart, and, and we just trust that the Lord is using us as we interact with one another to, to be an encouragement, to be a blessing, and to uh, prepare you to go back out there uh, with joy of the Lord in your hearts. Uh, as I mentioned uh, first Sunday last month that I'm going to take one Sunday a month. I'm going to try when we can the first Sunday of the month, but last week we uh, had uh, that special weekend. Rob Gottslig was uh, ministering, and so today I'm going to uh, focus again this Sunday on the attributes of God. Uh, last Sunday we looked at his attribute of being infinite, and this morning we're going to look at his attributes of being good and loving and perfect in, in all of his ways. And so, Father, we just thank you truly for who you are and that you are absolutely holy there is no one else like you. There is nothing else like you. You are absolutely unique and set apart in your perfection and in your goodness and in your love. And Lord, this morning as we look into your word and as we gaze at your nature, I pray that you would fill our hearts with increased faith that we can trust such a good God, that you would fill our hearts with rejoicing and praise, uh, that we are blessed with such a God. And Father, we, we just gladly reflect back to you the glorious radiance of your worth, your value, your perfections. And I pray that as we do so, our confidence in you would just soar. And I ask for your enabling, that anointing of your spirit, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 
So, our last study, we saw that God is infinite, uh, meaning he has no limits whatsoever at all. And as you ponder that, a lot of times you'll encounter uh, theological challenges where uh, you just, well, how can that be? We have to always keep in mind that there is no limit to our God. There is nothing that is impossible for him. Today, we're going to look at the goodness of God. And we will see that his goodness is without limit. In fact, all of his attributes are infinite. There is no limit whatsoever to any of God's attributes. Now, the Bible teaches that our God is a good God and that he is a God of love, perfectly flawless in his goodness and perfect in his love. Uh, Many people in the world today, including many who claim to be Christian, believe that all of the religions essentially worship the same God. But when we look at, for example, the many terrorist activities being done around the world motivated by the teaching of the Quran and carried out in the name of Allah, it seems clear that Allah is not a good God and certainly not a God of love. But our God is good, and he is love. However, throughout history, there have been many atrocities that have been committed by religious people claiming to act on behalf of our God. Think of the the Catholic Crusades and the Inquisitions, South African apartheid, American slavery, the many cruel acts of anti-Semitism carried out by even professing Christians throughout the centuries, even to this present day. And therefore, is our God truly a good God? Or is there a dark side to our God? Many people would believe that there are some very good things to like about God, so long as he's in a good mood and you're on a good side with him. Many people wrongly believe that God is good to us only as long as we appease him, as long as we keep him happy, stay on his good side. But when he's angry, look out. These are misconceptions of God. And as a result of this kind of thinking, it is many people come to distrust God. They don't like him. Many of them foolishly believe that God is responsible for all the evil, the sickness, the wars, the crime and suffering in the world. Therefore, he cannot be a good God. And he cannot be fully trusted if all the good and the evil in the world are his responsibility. And therefore, they conclude that it's safest to be secular, to be thoroughly non-religious, to ignore God, to pretend that he doesn't even exist. But communist atheists in China, the Soviet Union, and North Korea, in their opposition to religion, have put to death by slaughter and starvation between 60 and 100 million people in the last century, depending on your sources. Now, clearly, trying to ignore God does not create a better society as communism has endeavored. Often because of the hurtful way in which many people were raised by bad parents or because of the way they were taught by bad teachers. Many people have the misconception that God is a bully with a big stick who finds pleasure in making people miserable, sometimes for no reason at all. and He just waits for you to step across the line and he'll let you have it. Obviously, people who have this distorted concept of God cannot trust him. They are afraid of him. They hate him. They wrongly think God doesn't like us, that he doesn't want us to enjoy life. Some mistakenly believe that God hates everyone who does not love him, 
or that he hates you when you fail to live up to his rules. These are all grossly perverted, warped, and entirely untrue concepts of what God is like. And they are promoted by the spiritual enemies of God who often disguise themselves as God. And so this morning we want to begin to set the record straight about what our God is really like. The Bible teaches us that God is our creator. He made us because he wants us, and he wants us to enjoy life. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and you might have it abundantly. He is the one who put in your heart the desire for good things. He put in your heart the longing for happiness and the appetite for pleasure. Where did that desire, that longing come from? God put it in you. And he intends and desires to satisfy it, to gratify it. Psalm 34, verse 8, and I'm going to quickly go through a lot of short little verses. But uh, Psalm 34, verse 8 says, O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed. That means happy, satisfied, and enviable. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Psalm 119, and verse 68 says of God, you are good, and I and do good. Teach me your statutes. Exodus 34, verse 6. The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth. Did you catch that? He's abounding in goodness. Isaiah 63, verse 7. I will mention the loving kindness of the Lord and the praises of the Lord according to all that the Lord has bestowed on us and the great goodness toward the house of Israel which he has bestowed on them according to his mercies. That means they don't deserve it, but it's according to his mercy, his goodness, according to the multitude of his loving kindnesses. So what does it mean when the Bible says that God is good? It means that he is morally pure, free from anything wicked or evil. There is no wickedness, there is no evil whatsoever in God. He is absolutely holy, pure, separate from this world, unlike anything in this world. He is righteous and just. There is no injustice in him. There is no unfairness. You can never say of God, that's unfair. You may think he's unfair, but when the facts become known, you will realize, God, you were perfect in your justice. To be a good God means that he is a God of integrity, always telling the truth and always faithful to do what he says. You can trust him. When the Bible says that God is good, it means that he is loving and he's consistent in his goodness. He never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. 1 John 4, verses 16 to 18 says, God is love. That word love comes from the Greek word agape, and so God is agape. It doesn't just God expresses agape, God has agape. No, God is agape. Love is his nature. It is his character. It is the essence of who he is. And he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. He who, who lives in, in a, a state of love is living in, in God, abiding in God. And God is in him producing that, creating that. Uh, you meet a loving person, truly genuinely loving person. Where does that love come from? It is the expression of God in their life. And he can express his love through unbelievers. He can express his love through creatures. 
He can express his love through his creation. He can display it through his creation. He often does. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, you might want to turn there. It's uh, the love chapter. And it is applying the love of God to people when the love of God is in you and the spirit of God is in you and working through you. This is how it is going to be expressed. Let me just take some highlights out of, out of that. Um, verse 4, love is patient or long-suffering. That's what God is. Each one of those occurrences of the word love, agape, you can substitute it accurately for God. God is patient. That's what God is. And that's a good thing, isn't it? God is patient with us. He's long-suffering with us. Love is kind. That's what God is. And it's good that he is kind. He's not mean. He's not a bully. He's kind. Verse 5, part way through, God's love is not easily angered. God keeps no record of wrongs, or love keeps no record of wrongs. He forgives. These are all good things. Verse 6, love does not delight in evil, but it rejoices with the truth. In fact, the Bible says that God takes no delight, no pleasure in the death of the wicked. It does not satisfy his heart when the wicked die. He loves them. Verse 7, it always protects, always perseveres. Love never fails. It doesn't give up. Now, part of what makes God good is his beauty. Uh, The Bible talks about the beauty of God. There's, There's nothing ugly in God, nothing ugly in him. There is nothing undesirable about God. In Psalm 27, verse 4, David desired to behold the beauty of the Lord. And repeatedly, the Bible tells us to worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. We worship this attribute of God's goodness when we sing to him lyrics like, uh, you are beautiful beyond description, too marvelous for words, too wonderful for comprehension, like nothing ever seen or heard. Absolutely true of our God. We saw in our last study of God's attributes that God is infinite in all of his attributes, meaning there's no limit, there's no boundary. That God God is what he is up to this point, but he doesn't go beyond it. No, there are no limits. There is no boundary. That includes his goodness. There's no limit to his goodness. He's he's good up to this point, but you step across that and, and he's not good anymore. No, he is infinitely good. His goodness never runs out. It never wears out. It never comes to an end. He is always good in all that he does. That is what the Bible teaches about God. He will never change. He will always be good. He can never be anything but good. He is not a moody God. He's not unpredictable. He is always only good. And always only loving. And right away, people in their minds, well, how can a good God fill in the blank? How can a loving God, why do these things happen? Why is this in, in his world, in his creation? We don't always understand him. His ways are above our ways. As the heavens are high above the earth, so high are his ways above our ways and his thoughts above our thoughts. One of the attributes of God that we'll get to eventually is he's incomprehensible. We cannot wrap our minds around him. We cannot fathom him, comprehend him. But we can trust that God is good all the time. And he tells us he is. And another of his attributes, he cannot lie. And he demonstrates that he is. God is perfect in goodness. 
He lacks nothing that is good. If there's something that is good, it comes from God. It comes from his nature. He lacks nothing that is good. And there is nothing in God that is not good. There is no flaw. There is no weakness in his goodness. There will never be anything about God or his actions that you can point to and say, that isn't good. Every, everything else about God is good, but that isn't good. No, there's, it's all good. What well, sure doesn't look good. Well, that's because you're a fallen creature and your understanding is limited and you can't see uh, the whole picture. And so often in our finiteness and our limited understanding, we jump to wrong conclusions about God simply because we don't understand him. But only God is infinitely good. Angels are good, but they're not infinitely good. There is a limit to their goodness, and that is why Satan and his demons, who once were angels, rebelled against God and fell because they weren't perfect in their goodness. God demonstrates his goodness in the way he looks after the needy. He is lavish, abounding, and generous in giving good gifts. The Bible says that he is merciful toward all. Look at Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. We've been studying through this recently. Part of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. But he doesn't treat any of us according to what we deserve according to what our sins deserve. And here we have the expression of God's character. Remember, Jesus said, if you're going to be followers, if you're going to be citizens of his kingdom, you need to reflect his character, reflect his nature, and this needs to be true of you. Verse 44, But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. In other words, that you may be like God. You're created in his image. You're meant to be like him. This is the way he is. Now this is the way we are to, way, the way we are to be. And to trust him for that enabling. Then he gives an example, for God makes his son rise on the evil and on the good. And he sends rain on the just and on the unjust. Brothers and sisters, I can assure you it is a good thing that I'm not God. (laughs) Because there's people in this world who would never see the light of day. (laughs) And they would live in a perpetual desert... They they would never taste any of the goodness of this planet. But that's not our God. Our God is good. And he's loving. And it's unconditional. God's involvement in our lives is always to bring good into our lives. This is one of the truths that we need to stand upon in times when the storms of life are are throwing you for a loop. Uh, Stand on this solid ground that I don't understand what's going on in my life right now, Lord, but you are good in all of your ways towards me. And your involvement in my life is always to bring about a good end and a good purpose. So it doesn't matter what your issue, what your struggle, what your crisis, what your need. If you are a child of God, you can have absolute assurance that God is intending to use this for good in your life. Romans 8.28, that familiar passage, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. And who have been called according to his purpose. That is an absolute statement. That in all things, our good God is working for your good. Because he is good. Because God is perfectly good, 
He's never in a bad mood. He gets angry, but he never loses his temper. Anger is not a sin. It's when we let our anger control us and take over us that that's sin. But he never loses his temper. His actions are always motivated by his love, by his goodness, by his justice. If you are his child, you never need to be afraid to approach God. Even if you have been unfaithful to him, you never need to be afraid to approach God. Unfortunately, many of us have been told something different about God's nature. Everything that comes from God, his decrees, means his, his word, his laws, his creation, his thoughts, his actions, even his discipline, his justice, and his punishment of sin cannot be anything but good. It is right. It is impossible for God to do anything but good. Deuteronomy 6.24 says that even his commandments are for our good always. James 1.17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting. He doesn't change. This means that there is nothing good in the world that does not come from God. Try as hard as you can to find some good in the world, and the origin of it, the source of that goodness, is God himself. He is the ultimate source of all goodness. God's goodness isn't expressed only to man, but it is expressed to all of his creation. In Psalm 145, verse 8 and 9, it says, The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercy. The Lord is good to all. Not only those who love him, he's good to all. And his tender mercies are over all of his works. His goodness is lavished upon his creation and is displayed through his creation. God takes care of the animals in the wild, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea. God cares for and he provides for them. Now we're going to watch a video in just a second that's going to display this. But Psalm 33 verse 5 says that the earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. Now watch with me this video clip that will illustrate that truth. God gave us sight so that we can experience the world visually. And when we look around us, we discover that this world is achingly beautiful for us to look at, unnecessarily so. In fact, there's no functional reason why sunrises and sunsets should be that colorful. There's no reason why the landscapes of the world should be so diverse and so brilliant for our eyes. God could, if he'd wanted to, given us a planet that looked as uniform as the surface of Mars, and as long as the ground was fertile, we could have survived in such a place. But God didn't do that. God didn't give us what was merely serviceable. Instead, God has given us something absolutely brilliant, with a diversity of rainforests, tropical beaches, snow-capped mountain ranges, Arctic tundra, sparkling rivers, Serengeti plains, deep blue oceans. He gave us a world that changes with the seasons so that we can see different kinds of beauty in autumn, winter, spring, spring and summer. He filled the world with animals that range from adorable to awe-inspiring. The world that we live in is staggeringly beautiful for us to look at. Now, unfortunately, we can become easily habituated to our surroundings and therefore blinded to the beauty of what's around us every day. But try and see all of this again for the first time. Surely we can only conclude that if there was a creator behind this world, then for him to have made it so excessively beautiful 
he really must love us very, very much. He's not just given us an environment in which we can survive, but he's been lavish about its appearance. Some of the scenery that can be experienced here on Earth is positively breathtaking. God gave us the ability to hear so that we might experience his creation audibly too. But again, there's no functional reason why the world should then be filled with so many unnecessarily beautiful sounds. As I make this episode, it's early morning and I can hear a chorus of birdsong outside of the window. When it rains outside, the water thrums on the ground and tip taps on the window panes and creates a white noise so soothing that it sends us to sleep. We live in a world where wind rustles through the trees, where fallen leaves crunch pleasingly beneath our feet, where fires crackle and where oceans lap calmly upon the shore. We live in a world of laughter, a world of music and song so beautiful they can evoke elation and even tears of joy. We live in a world of poetry and dance. It's all so unnecessarily good. We could have functioned on a planet without any of those things and never even known what they were, but since they do exist and since they do please us so much, we can only conclude that if there is a God behind all of this, then to give us all of these unnecessarily amazing amazing and beautiful sounds, he really must love us very much. He's been absolutely extravagant in his goodness towards us. God gave us the ability to taste, but again, there's no functional reason why our tongue should be able to pick up the variety of flavours that it can, or indeed why the food we eat should be anything other than strictly utilitarian. I mean, once God gave us taste buds, he had to make the food palatable enough that we could cope with putting it down our throats for survival. But beyond that, everything else about food is pure excess. I sometimes find myself eating a piece of fruit, such as a mango, and thinking, this is far more delicious than it actually needs to be. I'd have eaten this fruit if it had half the flavour. And yet I am conscious that what I am tasting has come direct from the imagination of a good God. The psalmist wrote, taste and see that the Lord is good. And there's a sense in which we can do that very literally with food. The food that we taste, especially fruit, vegetables, and that which is made from grains, literally testifies to the goodness of God. And of course, it's not just the flavors which are beautiful, but it's the variety of those flavors too. God could, if he'd wanted to, have made everything taste like oats. Now, there's nothing wrong with oats. I like oats, but I'm personally glad that not everything tastes like oats. I am happy that other tastes are available. And he's given us all kinds of vegetables, peas, carrots, parsnips, potatoes, peppers, tomatoes, swedes. We have all kinds of grains too and things we can make very easily from basic ingredients, bread, cheese, chocolate, baked goodies. We have fruits, bananas, strawberries, pears, apples, grapes, and of course, mangoes. It's simply not necessary to have this variety of flavors. We could have survived with far less than all of this, but God has been luxuriant in pouring out his blessings upon us. We can only conclude therefore that he is very kind and that he loves us very much. God gave us a sense of smell, but again, there's no functional reason why the world should then be filled with such beautiful fragrances for our nose. My mind instantly recalls a time I was walking down a pathway in Migdal on the way to the Sea of Galilee in Israel around 2012. There were these pinkish white flowers lining the sides of the path. I don't know what they were. I want to say jasmine, but really I've got no idea. But what I do know is that their fragrance literally filled the air that day. It was absolutely heavenly. Now, Flowers needn't smell that good. Yes, the aroma has a function to attract pollinating insects and such like, but the aroma needn't have been such a beautiful one. Dogs, after all, communicate through the smell of urine and poo, so it's possible to get the job done with any old stench. Yet God chose to make flowers smell absolutely fantastic. And there are other smells too, of course, that almost give us a euphoric delight freshly cut grass in the summer, the smell after the rain, the smell of the beach, food cooking on the stove, wood, pine forests, perfumes, fresh linen, fresh air for that matter. Aren't you glad that you've been alive to have those experiences? A God who's been so excessive with these things could only be described as very kind and extremely good. And then finally, there's touch. God gave us the ability to experience the material world through sensitive nerve endings in our bodies. And having done so, again, there's really no reason why the world should then be filled with things so unnecessarily pleasurable for that sense. There are things we touch in this world and they bring us neither sadness or joy. And the whole world really 
could have been filled with such things and we would have survived, we would have got by in such a world and yet in reality that's not what's happened. In reality we have been blessed with so, so much more. There's the feel of bare feet on sand, a cosy warm bed, the cold side of the pillow, the sun on your skin, a cool breeze in summer, a dog's fur between your fingertips, freshly sanded wood, warm showers, massages, hugs, kisses and yes sex too. Aren't you glad that you're alive to experience a world such as this that contains so much unnecessary beauty for the touch? We can only really conclude that a God who provided so much excess in this respect is very kind and loves us very, very much. He's given us far more than we really actually needed or indeed could ever really have asked for. A good God. That video clip was taken from a, a very solid and high quality teaching series that I highly recommend uh, that's easily accessed online. Uh, search for The Fuel Project and on that website you will find a teaching series called The Reason for Pain, which is this clip comes out of that series, but that reason for pain goes into an in-depth and very well done uh, study of the question, if God is good, why does he allow pain? It's an excellent study on that, and so that's uh, the FUEL project. Uh, the study is the reason for pain. And Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, says, In the beginning that God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. That was the conclusion after his creation. Everything that he made, it was very good. And yes, there is a lot of evidence of God's goodness in this world. We saw much of that on the video clip. But there is also evil in the world. And so why is there so much evil in the world if the God who created the world is so good? Is there, again, a dark side to him. Did God create evil? No, he did not. But God gave both his angels and us people, his creation, he gave us a will. And he gave them freedom to choose. Because he's a good God. And he doesn't force. He doesn't coerce. He doesn't make us. He gives us the choice. And he set before them, good tree, bad tree. It's not really what they're called. but uh, And we had to choose. We could all choose to trust his goodness that he has shown us, that he has demonstrated, that he has displayed, that he's a good God, that he's trustworthy. Or we could reject him, believing that there is a better way than God's way, and somehow he is withholding from us some good. Freedom is a good thing. It comes from God. We value freedom. We value freedom from oppression, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom to travel outside the country, freedom to choose our career, freedom to choose our spouse, or our political leader. Freedom is good, but if we use our freedom to act independently of God, and this is a simple definition of sin, a simple definition of evil, using our freedom to choose independently of God, it is always damaging when we do that because we are choosing something other than good something other than God, something other than his good way. And therefore, to act independently of what is good is always going to be bad for us. Even if it starts out feeling really good. So why is there so much evil in the world? Because our ancestors, but it has been passed on to all of us, we choose to act independent of God, choose to do our own thing. We choose to go our own way. And God gives us that freedom to choose, but 
we are not able to make our own way work because we are not intrinsically good. We do not have the attributes of God. We are not God. But God is good, and his ways are right, and his ways bring life and joy. And therefore, to use your good God-given freedom to choose contrary to God is sin, and it is always destructive. And therefore, it is the sin of man that has resulted in violence, in war, death, that covers the earth. It is mankind rejecting God's good way that destroys and pollutes and endangers God's good creation. God created a good, but man, in choosing to reject God's good ways, has brought damage uh, incalculable damage to our lives and to our planet. Sometimes the pain we suffer is caused by our own bad choices, and sometimes it is caused by the bad choices of others. But if you are a child of God, even when we experience evil consequences of our selfish choices or the consequences of other people's selfish choices, First or 2 Corinthians 4.17, for example, assures us that God uses all those afflictions to work for us an exceedingly glorious and eternally good outcome. So even when we screw up and go against God's ways, our good God is able to take those things and use them for our good, to work them ultimately for our good, though we have taken a difficult way of getting there that had we followed him, uh, the way would have been much less painful. God can do nothing else but good for his children. But often because of our short-sighted limitations caused by sin or because of our spiritual immaturity, we cannot always see the good that God is working out through the painful realities of sinful, rebellious world. So why has God allowed so many billions of sinful, rebellious people to live so long on his planet? And why does he allow them to continue enjoying his planet while they reject him their entire life long? Why does he continue to keep their rebellious bodies going? I said, if I was God, <laughs> I, I wouldn't give them another breath. But why does he continue? Why does he continue? Those, those beautiful expressions of his goodness and his, his love and his life, those aren't enjoyed only by his children. Those are enjoyed by all who are on this planet, all of his creation. And why does he let them continue to enjoy it? And here's the big one. Why would God bother to come to earth and to be put to death by his creation on a cross as our substitute to pay the penalty for our sin? The answer is because he is perfect in his goodness and he loves us with an infinite love. And his word says that the Lord is long-suffering toward us not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, to turn back to him, to turn back to his way. Thank God that he has allowed you to live so long in your rebellious state that you might hear of his goodness, that you might hear of his love, that you might have another chance to respond to him. John 3.16, for God so loved the world. His goodness was so great that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Why does God let you continue living this long in your, in your sinful state? Because he loves you. And he wants you to have a chance to fully experience forever his love. Romans 5, verses 6 to 8. 
The Bible says, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone may, might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The ultimate expression of love. Look at how perfect Jesus' goodness was. Even while he was hanging, dying on the cross with his enemies all around taunting him, what came out of his mouth? It wasn't venom. It wasn't bitterness. But he said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. That is our good God. Our God's goodness goes beyond our ability to comprehend. Where are you today in your relationship with this God? Are you his follower? Or have you bought into some lie that he's not that good, that he's not what we have just seen portrayed of him? Are you living your own life independent of God because you don't trust him, because you don't like him? How have you responded to God's greatest act of kindness, sending his son to die in your place that you might have life everlasting? How have you responded to God's goodness to a rebellious world? How have you responded to his many blessings that you have, have seen and heard and tasted and smelt and touched and enjoyed? People resist death because they want to cling to the wonderful blessings that God has given us in this life. But that will all come to an end if you die having rejected the creator of it all because he gives you the choice. And you must choose your eternal destiny. Is it going to be with him who created all of this in part of his creation, in a fuller part of his creation, or is it going to be him giving you what you asked for and getting out of your life and letting you experience the rest of your everlasting existence apart from him, the good God, and from any of his goodness. The choice is ours. Have you entered into a right relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ? You can do that right here today. What do you need to do in order to enter into a right relationship with God, to become a child of God? rather than to remain forever separated from him and his goodness. The Bible says that you must repent of living independently of God and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ who died in your place and believe that he is offering to you his life in exchange for your future death. As you put your faith in Jesus Christ, trusting that he has taken care of everything that needs to be done to make you right with God, he will, in his goodness, he will bring you into a whole new experience of life. He will put in you a new spirit. And he will, from this day on, begin leading you in a life of goodness, a life of love, a life of purpose, a life of fulfillment, that you have never experienced and have never imagined possible. Living as a child, a loved child of a perfect God who is perfect in all of his ways towards you. Heavenly Father, how can we ever thank you enough for your goodness, your love? Lord, I ask that you would change our concept of you, that you would change our thinking of you. Deliver us, Lord, from the lies of the enemy who is slandering you all the time at every turn, who is planting in the hearts of people wrong concepts of God. 
Lord, I pray that we would trust your word, your description of yourself, and that we would see the evidence of your goodness all around us. And Lord, you have given a choice, and you have allowed the alternative to also be seen all around us. Evil, darkness, cruelty, pain, death, or your goodness, your beauty, your life. Lord, we see the two options displayed before us. I pray that you would cause us all to trust you and to choose you and to follow you and to walk in your ways and to turn away from those deceptions and those lies. Lord, we ask you to deliver us from evil and guide us in paths of righteousness for your name's sake. And Heavenly Father, I pray that you would fill hearts in this room with faith and confidence in you. And I pray that you would motivate us to step out in obedience and in faith. Have your way in our lives, I pray. In the name of Jesus, amen.